And here we go. We have lift off. Propulsion continues to be normal. Our CPA chamber pressure looks good. Following up. We rise together, back to the moon and beyond. This is nothing to be exciting in the flare, correct? Hello everybody and welcome to another Falcon 9 launch and as you can already see on your view here we are looking at pad 39A for today's launch which is always an amazing opportunity to see uh, some great rocket launch today. My name is Adrian Bile. I'm your host for today's Starlink mission and we will not only talk about of course the, the mission that we will watch here today but also some Starship news that uh, dropped very close to the stream, which is very much related to 39A. So stay tuned for us with the next 57 minutes. There we go. That's a small teaser of what we're also going to talk about here. And of course, I have a Starship expert, I might say, here on with the stream uh, as a co-host, uh, Ryan Weber. Ryan, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic, Adrian. You know, 39A, Starlink. You know, don't get to see these very often, especially with all the specialty missions 39A launches, and it's shaping up to be a, you know, fun launch tonight. Absolutely, and I'm looking forward to dis discuss all Falcon and all Starship with you. And also with us in the field, we have Max. Max, how's it going? Good evening, everybody, and welcome to a, I must say, rather gorgeous evening here on the Florida Space Coast at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, it's going great. Um, hopefully the countdown, uh, can, uh, the countdown continues smoothly and we get a liftoff on time tonight. Should be gorgeous. Let's hope for that. And let's kick it off here with Ryan. Ryan, what are we expecting? What's, what's this mission today? So tonight is Starlink 6-42. Um... It's going to take 23 Starlink satellites up into uh, low Earth orbit here. Um, you know, they're going to, it's going to do a trajectory down, down southeast. Uh, just another one in this shell. Um, it's the 74th dedicated Starlink Gen 2 and the uh, you know, 148th uh, dedicated Starlink launch overall. So their SpaceX keeps racking up those numbers. Um, and uh, to a f fun note about this pad is that uh, today will break the the record turnaround time. Uh, so the new record for today, if, if it does launch, will be 7 days, 23 hours, and 18 minutes. And the record before this one was 8 days, 19 hours, and 20 minutes. So SpaceX keeps chugging along with Falcon 9, just like everything else. It feels like it's another week, another turnaround record at this point. Everything, they are, they are going for records here. And uh, Max... Do you mind giving us a quick booster and recovery overview here? I sure can. So on the docket tonight over at LC-39A is booster B-1060 about to embark on its 19th flight. Uh, if it flies successfully tonight, it will become the third active uh, Block 5 booster in the fleet to cross the 19 flight threshold, which is remarkable. It should be four, but we all know what happened. <laughs> So yeah. let's see. Of its 19 flights, let's go down the list here. Um, deep breath. GPS 33, Starlink uh, version 1, launch 11, Starlink launch 14, Turksat 5A, Starlink launch 18, Starlink launch 22, Star Starlink launch 24, Transporter 2, uh, Starlink group 4 3, and Black Sky, Starlink group 4 group 4 6, Starlink group 4 9, excuse me, Starlink 4 14, Starlink 4 19. Galaxy 33 and 34, Transporter 6, Starlink Group 515, 6, 618, Nova C and, I, and Nova CIM-1 holding up at its latest mission launching on February 15th. 
uh, and it, it will be launching downrange tonight on a southeast on a southeast trajectory, uh, ho hoping looking to touch down on the drone ship. Just read the instructions. And the fairing the fairing recovery ship tonight will be Bob. So we are on. I mean, we have pretty much all of the, all of the veterans out, out there tonight, and conditions are looking stellar. So let, let's go. There we go. I'm looking forward to see hopefully another recovery. Again, 19th recovery, kind of an iffy topic. Uh, we are all still uh, sadly remembering B10, B1058. So let's hope that uh, today's booster is not joining that fate and indeed uh, shows a successful recovery from this. It's mission. also B1058's uh, closest living sibling, and hopefully it stays that way for a while. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's, let's hope everything goes well today. So I, I teased some Starship things here, Ryan. What did we just observe here regarding Starship on 39A? So, uh, I, as some people who are pretty observant may have noticed, in the last, like, two weeks, SpaceX has started to pick up work on Starship launch pad at 39A. Uh, they were taking off some of the, the sheathing that they have for the, rib, the rebar cages around the, uh, the OLM legs. And it looked like they were preparing to roll out the OLM and possibly put it on. However, uh, within the last few days, they have knocked down what looks like two full legs of the OLM there. Um, it's kind of interesting because SpaceX has probably changed the design for that pad. It was it was always interest. It was always odd to me that they pushed so hard to make to build this pad before they ever flew anything out of the one out of Boca, um, because then you're gonna have to change stuff after the fact. But I, I'm really curious to see what their plan is here because they might be like changing the entire foundation or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's it's certainly interesting that we see like a whole lag removal uh, taking place. And I mean, so far. It seems that we get the impression they will do it with potentially all. Max, what's what's your take on this? Were, were you surprised to see less legs on this OLM? I mean, that was like possibly the biggest psych move SpaceX could have could have ever pulled. It's like we finally see movement on the orbital launch mount moving out of the hangar, and now suddenly two of the orbital launch mount legs over at the pad are missing. It's like, what, like what, what's happening here, guys? Uh, but at the same time, they, they they more than likely do have to reinforce or redo the foundation over there. And let's not forget, they still have to implement and uh, install a water deluge system plate uh, um, at at the bottom there. So maybe uh, taking off a couple of legs there that probably weren't up to snuff and keeping the 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 o the OLM off itself for a little while uh, will will aid with a a hopefully speedy install of of those systems. Uh, but yeah, it it's. It was a pretty, a pretty strong surprise to see those being being taken out so suddenly. Yeah, absolutely. And just for people who are like wondering what did just fell, that was a video of the OLM lag removal. So don't get that. That was fine. There you can see it again. You can see the lag, and then they remove it. And we saw them before attaching stuff to it. So this is definitely a planned removal. So and that was in real uh, time yeah. too. So that was just all gravity taken over it, which is kind of <laughs> funny. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, as always, we want to make this inter as interactive as possible. And of course, I'm, we are opening it up for Starship questions today here as well for the Cape. So uh, if you have questions about today's Starlink mission and also about Starship at the Cape, make sure to tag at NASA Spaceflight in chat, which will make sure that we get all of these questions in a handy little tool. And we will make sure to hit as much as we can over the next 50 minutes. And let me also quickly thank some members that recently joined our membership program here, which enables all of this and makes sure we have uh, cameras and people at the Cape and keep people in Boca. Like this is this is all that we can do thanks to the membership program. Uh, let me start with Matthew Zabel becoming a Capcom member. Thank you so so much. John Flummerfeld, Flummerfeld uh, becoming a Patrep member. Uh, Bear La Bear becoming a Padrat member. Thank you so, so much. And then Elizabeth Höppner becoming a uh, gifting, actually, five Red Team memberships. Thank you so, so much for that. And I hope everybody said thank you for that. And then Wilbo Tiberius Baggins, a very common name we hear here, uh, with two times 20 Red Team memberships gifted. That's 40 Red Team memberships gifted in a chat by Wilbo Tiberius Baggins. Again, thank you so, so much. I know you're 
quite a common name we hear uh, doing these very generous supports here, Volbo. So uh, thank you so, so, so much for that. And with that, let's start to uh, get in some some questions um, here where we, uh, while we, while we look at what, what's happening here today. Um, I don't know if we can answer this, but it's, it's quite interesting to, to speculate how soon it might happen. Which booster, so the question is, which booster will be the first to break 20 flights? Which I'm not sure if we can say that, but um, Ryan, it might happen soon, right? Like, like we are getting dangerously close to 20 flights on the Falcon 9. Yeah, it's it'll be kind of interesting to see which booster does it. Um, I'm trying to remember which one's in turnaround right now. I think it's 62 off the top of my head. Um, might be the one that that ends up hitting that mark first, um, which is it's a pretty significant milestone. Uh, whatever booster does it and multiple boosters do it. Um, I, the, the thing I'm always curious is how far can SpaceX push these boosters? Because eventually they might come across where the weld lines on the tank start ha start having issues or something along those lines. And I'm really, really curious to, you know, I would love to know where their issues are over the course of time, but you know, they won't tell us that. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's, it's always interesting because there's for sure a lot of like gathering and knowledge, uh, gathered by SpaceX about these refurbishments. And I wonder, like, if there's a... Like, I would love to peek into this knowledge. I would love to understand what they learned. Like, what what are the items they are really watching? What is... Maybe there's something totally unexpected that they are watching that uh, I didn't expect, maybe, as an item. So, always, always interesting to see. Um, well, before I hit the next question here, Max, uh, regarding the picture as quality of today's launch, do you mind giving us a quick overview why this launch might be really, really special in terms of visual qualities? Absolutely. So the current T0 holding at, well, is actually slated just about four minutes after local sunset. So we will see Falcon 9 ascend back into the sunlight against a dark sky, which hopefully will be a, a remarkably stunning visual or just a, an, an amazing sight, honestly. I'm I'm always, I'm always dumbfounded for words around those. <laughs> we we haven't had a launch around around sunset in a long time, and they're always a, a real big treat. Uh, and the weather here is also looking fantastic. We have some clouds in the sky, but honestly, they they I would say they add to the picturesque scene here at KSC, and hopefully it will keep trending in the right direction, as we like to say. Um, but yeah, launch is currently slated four minutes after local sunset, and actually a nearly full moon. Uh, should should actually be risen about a ha about a half hour ago now, and will be around from our perspective. I think it'll be around between launch complex forty and forty one. So, just either way, if it goes on time tonight, it should. It, there are multiple. It, it's going to be a visual feast, I guess you could say. There we go. Yeah, I'm I'm really hoping for that. I I am looking forward to the. The tracking and also the stilts we'll get from you, Max, and and also D, who's also in the field for us here. So uh, we have we have double the power here in terms of uh, people in the field covering, and hopefully we will get some nice shots. Um, lukewarm, lukewarm milk here asking the fairing looks bigger. Is there any reason for that, Ryan? Uh, could just be the lighting. Um, it's it's not bigger. Their fairings are the, are the same size. It could be the lighting. Could also be it's a little bit city and burnt up because they're reused fairings sometimes the lighting can play tricks on you perspective wise but they're the yep. same size yeah yeah absolutely i mean there is there's always this thing of like oh they're they're developing a bigger fairing fairing right yeah they might do that like we know they're doing that for some potential space force mission and some other missions in the future but they are not using these on a starlink right now anything like there's the new fairing has not debuted yet and this is certainly not the new fairing this is it would uh, be, a standard it would be, Falcon 9 fairing. It would be quite the sight to see it on Falcon 9, even though I think the, the extended fairings are, I think, solely slated right now for Falcon Heavy. So, Yep. Would be really interesting to see in a Falcon 9, though, right? Like, like an even bigger Falcon 9, Falcon 9. It's already so stretched, and mm -hmm. even, even longer Falcon 9 would... I think that would be weird. It would be one of the most cursed-looking rockets ever made, especially if... 
if it's carrying something something that big and that heavy, it may it may as well be slated to be expended, which means no landing legs, no grid fins, and potentially a throwaway interstage as well, which would look just completely cursed. And that and on top of that, even though it might not make sense, throw in a um, a stage two uh, MVEX stubby nozzle on there just for kicks, you know. It would kind of look like the Atlas V with like the single SRB, but like take the SRB off, and it's just the just the core stage Atlas V with the five meter fairing. It, so it's it, also it, it it's, like. it's also narrower than than the core stage of of an Atlas V, so it'll yeah. look just even weirder. But yeah, I think it, it it would look very similar to that for sure. That's just cursed. I yep. I want to have a protocol <laughs> this that I think this is just cursed, and I don't want this. Uh, this is this is my feedback to this. Uh, and also, I want to point out, since it was mentioned, there's no stubby nozzle on today's mission, and they will not be on today's mission. So there we there we go. Um, let's see. I will be in Miami in the fourth, fifth, and this uh, and the Bahamas on the sixth. Are there any launches these days? I might see. So I looked this up. Uh, right now, the on the 39A front, we have a launch of Bandwagon One planned on the or like 40, 40 or 39A on April 7th. Uh, there might be something else on the corresponding other pads, so either 39 or 40 uh, on the on the same range, on like the fifth or sixth range. I would say your chances are not zero because, uh, as always with Falcon 9, there's quite a cadence, but. Uh, I, I would say there's uh, there's a decent chance that there might be a Starlink in that area. And of course, with Starlinks, correct me if I'm wrong here, Max, but they like Bahamas region, that would actually be the, the area where right now the the um, six uh, Starlink groups are actually flying along, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, they're, they're all holding, I think it's around a 30-something, I think it's around 37 or 38 degree um, orbital inclination, which means they're flying southeast from, from our perspective. I think actually 43 degrees, Alex, in the back channel. Thank you. Uh, but but because they're flying towards the Bahamas, you know, actually, because the, the Bahamas are actually um, ahead of us still, I think Jared Isaacman posted a picture last week of, of a stunning jellyfish that, 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 that he captured from over there last week for a Starlink mission. And I think it'll be roughly the same today, if not better, from, from, the, from, from their perspective. So anywhere really south of here, even, even on, on the... The, the Florida mainland it should be in an awesome view. Yep, there we there we go. It would be it would be quite fortunate maybe from timing. Uh, I I really want to see like I, w I wonder if like some some point we'll get a camera like in the Bahamas region at night or something and just have a track from there. Might be might be cool to do. That'd be awesome. Uh, maybe some I different fully, angle. I fully support this. <laughs> Uh, Kirk Rains here asking, do you think the active solar activity could scrub a launch? Ryan, could heavy solar activity scrub a launch? Yeah, they could probably scrub a launch, you know, interference with communications, you know, if they, if the rocket get in, gets into orbit, but then they, you know, can't talk to it or something, or it could even disrupt the electronics on board the, uh, the rocket. So I could say, yeah, it. In in a case, it probably could delay a rocket launch. And we also had the situation in the past where uh, there was this whole bunch of uh, Starlinks that failed uh, thanks to a solar storm because mm -hmm. they, they've they basically launched into a, a solar storm and that made them go into a safes mode and that basically resulted in the whole batch failing. So uh, SpaceX certainly has some experience with solar storms. And yes, there is some increased solar activity in the last few days and there are some reports, but I bet if like if we know about this and if people on Twitter know about this, there's a very good chance SpaceX is also monitoring this and feel very much safe to launch right now. And if they don't, they will inform us. Um, so there we go. And also just to point this out, since then they have launched into a higher orbit as well uh, they were like launched into a super low orbit for starlings which then basically meant since they lost time where they couldn't raise their orbit thanks to the solar activity they would deorbit so um that's just the 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 situation with that um 
So there was this weird Starlink launch the other day, Ryan, right? I know we talked about it in Twist. We talked about it uh, also back. So uh, Brain Dare is asking, can you guys address the discrepancy in the Starlink launch at Vandenberg? Did SpaceX launch Starshield satellites? Why did they show the payloads? Yeah, according to uh, Jonathan McDowell even had a tweet about this. Um, it looks like it's likely that SpaceX did launch uh, two classified payloads, probably two star shields. Um, so that's probably where the discrepancy comes from. Uh, so, and as as we all know, with you know U.S. Space Force, NRO, the DoD as a whole, they they like to keep their their classified stuff secret, classified, and you know you can't see it. So that's probably why they didn't show it, and there is that uh, little discrepancy there. Yep. But uh, yes, basically, we can kind of confirm that there, or like at least very highly speculate, or high confidence speculate, that there in fact was classified payloads on that mission. And that's why they didn't show it, uh, the, the payloads. And that also was why there were some off nominal parameters on that mission versus the, the usual Starlink. So uh, interesting, interesting to see that they are using this. And there we have the tweet from uh, Jonathan McDowell himself. Uh, confirming uh, these these kind of uh, situation with the mission. Interesting that they use Starlink also for these kind of extras, I would say. Um, Canon Copeland asking, I'm showing this to Max, why have they been able to do much of more of the RTLS missions as of late? I mean, it all depends on where the the payload wants to go and if and and what Falcon 9 can can perform in that time and of course as uh SpaceX and NASA have have both established in recent months um they have established that Falcon 9 can support can support enough propellant margin to perform an RTLS um return over here at at the Cape which which of course saves time in in booster recovery and and and, and a whole bunch of other fronts so it, I, I guess it's all just about timing and and lining up payloads that that can all fly to a certain destination while while, while Falcon can can support an, an, an RTLS uh, comeback. So, I guess just timing for sure. Yeah, sometimes it just uh, lines up to be the perfect timing for an RTLS. Speaking of timing, uh, do you? Uh, I, I guess it's time to look at today's launch timeline which uh, already passed the first milestone, which is the 38-minute check where the launch director verifies go for propellant load. The next thing we will see is at T-minus 35 minutes, the Stage 1 RP-1 load will begin, and also the Stage 1 LOX load, and the Stage 2 RP-1 load. This is the moment where we can really spot that the rocket is in fact in countdown, because we will see condensation and frost forming. And that's the thing we wait for today, because uh, as you might know, these uh, Starlink missions are operating with a certain window. And this window can sometimes stretch for hours. So uh, once we see frost, that means they are locked in into a certain T0, and we know they are fueling and targeting a certain uh, timing in the window. So that's always the next step we are looking for. So get ready for that. They will start fueling, hopefully. At least that's the last update we got from SpaceX. And in uh, around 50 seconds from now, and two, three minutes after that is really when we will see condensation at the bottom of the rocket. And I know Max is always basically making sure that he spots it as soon as we can here. So uh, we will we'll update you as soon as we spot it here. Um, but let's go into more one more question maybe before we see Spro uh, Frost here. Um, let's see. Uh, here's a Starship question. Ryan, will SpaceX make the Starship Tower at 39A taller in favor for the V2 st uh, Starship version fairly soon? Uh, no. They're not going to make the tower taller. As much as I want a taller tower, um, they don't, and they don't need to do it even for V2 because it, as it looks right now, V2 is just going to be uh, reliability improvements and, um, you know, just general, like making it more simple and things like that. Uh, it's kind of, it's going to be more like along the lines of like version three, as Elon had talked about that, um, that'll probably have the stretch. Elon was recently even talking about 20 meter stretch which would put ship as the same size as booster, which that's just, I, I don't know. It just looks to me that would look wrong. I don't know if that's just me, 
but I I absolutely agree. Yeah, it's uh, it's certainly a thing. Uh, speaking of, uh, we actually have an update here from SpaceX. Uh, they have updated their website, and we can now confirm that they are now targeting a T zero in the in one hour and sixteen minutes from now. So they have actually delayed the mission here. We can here see the the SpaceX website. They will not go for fueling just yet, and they are going later into the window. This is a forty minute push back into the window so um yeah the good thing is max that's actually for some photography conditions maybe even a good news right yeah but you know it that's always i was really look, looking forward to it flying at its normal time just after sunset man that would have been so cool uh but yes that that then enters us into what we call prime jellyfish hour and for those who are not familiar uh, what we call a jellyfish is is essentially when uh, Falcon 9 is ascending either pre sun pre sunrise or post sunset at a certain time, and it flies essentially back into the sun's rays and the exhaust particulates that are left over from the from either the nine Merlin one Ds or the single MVAC on the upper stage um, is the lit up and is like very either vibrant orange blue or just a, a straight up white color in the sky in contrast against a dark either navy blue or black sky it is remarkable uh, but with it launching at 821 that's about 45 or so minutes i think just just after sunset which would put us right at prime jellyfish hour so i guess that would that would be a nice constellation prize but hopefully it actually flies then because after that it becomes just a normal uh nighttime launch which you know we love all launches. We, we love them all dearly, but there's something about evening and uh, just after sunset launches that just hit differently. Yeah, absolutely. We want different conditions, I guess. Like, that's the, the, good th the, the thing to say about this. Like, we want things that look different than what we have already seen. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's absolutely something that uh, we, we hope to, to see here. So I'm wishing SpaceX good luck to that this T0 actually sticks. But for now, that means that we will shortly go on a commentary break here, because, uh, well, there's, <laughs> there's only so much you can talk about every single Starlink, and we will also want to make sure that uh, we stay fresh for the part of the countdown where the action then really happens, and uh, that means that we will step away for a moment. And we will return at T-minus 40 minutes before T-0. And th that's the moment where we will resume commentary. So you will get some, uh, some sick beats, I might say, on your ears. Uh, and uh, until then, and then we will return once we are closer to launch again.
Hello everybody, Adrian here with a quick update. As you have maybe already seen, we have a slip further into the window. Based on the SpaceX website, SpaceX is now targeting 11.09 p.m. Eastern Time, which is in 3 hours and 39 minutes from now. Which means we will stay alive here, we will make uh, give you some more music, um, and we will resume commentary once we get closer. But again, just to repeat, if you're uh, just turning up your volume again, SpaceX has confirmed that they are now targeting very close to the end of the window at 11.09 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, the Starlink mission for today. That's 20 minutes before the closing of the window. Thank you.
All right, we are back for the launch of Starlink 6-42 from LC-39A at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Looks like the board is green, so hopefully we get a launch here tonight from SpaceX. I'm Jack Byer for NSF. You guys know the drill. If you have any questions, at NASA Space Flight in chat, and we'll see your questions pop up in some software we have running in the background. But it's not just me. We also have Max out in the field, ready to shoot tonight's launch. And we also have our ever-competent cohort of co-hosts, starting off with Alex. Alex, how are you doing, buddy? Well, I wasn't here before, so hi, everyone. And yeah, it, it seems like you know they got a really harsh rain raining down on, on this booster and, and, and rocket in general, I guess. Um, you know, if you scrub back on, on this stream, you'll see some of that, and also the the weather outlook um, that that we, that we had those those maps and how the board was all red and red is bad, right? Now it's freshly green. You can see everything is nice and and looks beautiful now. All of those clouds have moved away. All of that lightning seems to have moved. So yeah, man. That was quite a weather situation there. Well, you know how it goes in Florida. Sometimes you get a rainstorm or a thunderstorm popping up out of nowhere, but then disappearing just as quickly. So no big deal. Thankfully, teams appear to have worked through the issue. Also on today's stream, we have Mr. Ryan Weber. Ryan, how are you doing, buddy? Uh, I'm doing fantastic. Uh, hi again, everyone. You know, just sitting around waiting for weather to pass and I guess we're we're ready for Starlink again here. Yeah, let's launch some Starlink satellites into orbit. Uh, to be precise, 30 or 23 Starlink satellites. I can talk. Um remember that time this is a little off topic. Remember that time I ate <laughs> spicy chicken on stream and was dying yeah. the whole stream? Uh, I remember that. I was around for that. It was one of <laughs> Chief 24's static fires, I'm, I guess. I'm currently eating a Monterey Jack quesadilla, but it's got California Reaper peppers in it. So if I misspeak, you can blame it on the spicy food yeah. I'm eating. But either way, and SpaceX has just tweeted that propellant exactly. load has started for tonight's launch. So That's propellant is beginning to flow into the vehicle, which is exactly what we want to see at this point in the count. Alex, go ahead. Yeah, it is. It is right now what we're we're sort of hoping to to see from the rocket because it's already past the T minus thirty five minute point in the count. That is when the auto sequence starts and they begin the the propeller load onto Falcon Nine. Um, that is essentially when they start loading all propellants on the first stage, both liquid oxygen and RP one, and the RP-1 gets loaded onto the second stage of the Falcon 9. So that is good. That is confirmed now. SpaceX has called that as a confirmed thing. So we're good to go. And hopefully we're going to launch in 33 minutes. But again, um, that was one of the things that we're sort of doubtful here when we're coming back to, uh, with, with commentary. Because we had that lightning phase, right? Uh, lightning 2, right. lightning 1 uh, phase. And, and so, you know, usually we see... Frost around T minus thirty one minute mark, so in about one and a half minutes we should see that, that frost appearing. Excellent. Well we'll keep our eyes on the booster for signs of that propellant loading and the frost growing. Really quickly, I do want to thank some people who are coming out with some support. Daniel Hogben, one of those names we see pop up all the time, gifting five red team memberships. Richard Cochran becoming a red team member. It's YK. Thank you for the super chat. They say, I'll be on Mexico coast on a cruise for the eclipse. Multiple days. Chances of seeing a Vandenberg launch. Don't know direction. A VBS launch. I assume they mean Vandenberg. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, Vandenberg is launching like crazy these days. So if that's what you in fact mean, hopefully you have a fairly good chance. Wilbo Tiberius Baggins. We love you, buddy. Welcome back again. And thank you again for the incredible amount of support. They say, ah, jellyfish hour. Smashing. Is it, in fact, jellyfish hour? Or was this just an old super chat? It probably is an old super chat, because before we were hoping for a jellyfish, 
uh, launch, but unfortunately, yeah, it doesn't look like we're going to get one. Alas. But either way, thank you, Wilbo. Tiberius Baggins, Robert McClary, thank you for becoming a Padrat member. Sideshow Bob, thank you for the tip. The $5 tip to tips.nasaspaceflight.com. They say, best coverage at the Cape and Boca, hands down. Thanks, NSF. Thank you, Sideshow Bob. May you never step on a rake again. Um, K-Store? Thanks for becoming a pad or no, a Capcom member. Hey, at Capcom and above, you get Discord access. So pop into the Discord and say hello. You will be cre- greeted by our customary Forrest Gump waving gif. Steve Fuller becoming a Padrat member. Hudson Gomez becoming a launch director member. Thank you so much, Hudson Gomez. Uh, Patient Blau becoming a Padrat member. And Energy Sharky with a super chat saying, Any idea what the view will be like from Silver Springs? Been waiting since the original launch time. All right, I'm opening maps. Silver Springs, Florida. Silver Springs, Florida. This is really compelling streaming right here. By the way, as, as Jack looks looks that up you can see there the frost already appearing on the on the booster that is good that is good progress but yeah i'm not sure if maybe we can we can pull up the the usual um trajectory map thingy yeah if we can that would be great yeah maps maps is saying there's two silver springs floridas one in the panhandle one north of orlando so if you're just north of orlando you're probably good to go for seeing it if you're in the panhandle maybe not why are there two? Alex, so we're launching, and I say we, but SpaceX is launching Starlink satellites on tonight's mission. There's going to be 23. But we saw recently out of Vandenberg a very, uh, shall we say, odd Starlink hey. launch. Uh, do you think we'll see some similar weirdness tonight with this launch, or do you think that was sort of a one-off? Well, on today at least, we haven't seen the same indications that we saw for that other one, so we don't expect any surprises. On this one, it is pretty much the same as we've seen in the past uh, launches from the Cape uh, that are Group 6 missions. But I wouldn't be surprised if we get something, you know, in the future that is kind of weird. Uh, hi, helicopter. Um, but but yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see something interesting like that in the future, uh, which we now think it's probably like two Star Shield satellites. Um, I, I think we explained that on on Twist, and then after Twist, we got further confirmation from basically, you know, in between. Every single let me let me sort of rewind here. Every single classified satellite that is launched, even though it's classified, it gets some kind of tag to it, and it's usually like USA and then a number to it. So, for example, USA three forty nine or three hundred forty nine, um, whatever you prefer, that is the the X thirty seven B from the USSF fifty two launch, right? But the next classified object that has been identified come from the Electron launch with um, Live and Let Fly mission, which is 452. So it's like, where is 451 and 450, which are the two in between? And so the two in between could only be a mission that is in between USSF 52 and uh, let, you know, Live and Let Fly, or whatever it's the name of, of that mission with Electron. So the, the one that we think is Sonic 716, which was from Vandenberg last month, uh, last week. And, right. you know, SpaceX said at the beginning, we're launching 22 satellites. And then they removed any reference of 22 satellites on the website. They removed that after the fact as well on, on the website. They never mentioned again 22. And, you know, there are sites that are, are basically getting data from SpaceX saying how many satellites they're launching, where are they launching them. And they were told 20 instead, and the orbit was also higher instead of the usual uh, height. And so overall, it was quite suspicious. And now we see that there are two missing satellites in those sort of tags that they put to classified satellites, which are USA right. uh, 350 and USA 351. So it's like, well, yeah, everything seems to line up. 
Well, thank you for the recap there. I wonder if we'll see anything interesting on tonight's launch, but even if we don't, still good to have context for tonight's Starlink launch out of 39A. Speaking of 39A, this we have our very own Max you. Evans out there. Max, do we have you? Jack, is that you on a Starlink stream? Mm. What do you? What is that? What is? What are you? <laughs> what are you trying to say? Like I don't do Starlink streams. Hello. No, all I'm trying to say is that I miss you. That's all. Oh, I miss you too, buddy. <laughs> well, Max, give us a little bit of a sit rep. What's the situation like on the ground there at 39A? Uh, well, D and I, who's who's out with me, um, so. He, we were just sitting downstairs, um, chatting away, not in the, in the best of spirits, uh, that she it was going to go tonight. And then, lo and behold, uh, we hear that the board is green, and that prop load has started, and, and we began scrambling, get, getting all of our stuff to the to the hot roof again. And now we have feeds from both of our cameras, hopefully, and we are getting ready to go. So things went from zero to a hundred real quick. So it goes in the world of shooting rockets. That's right. Things can change rapidly. And thankfully, the change tonight means we are likely to see a launch from Falcon 9. So, excellent. All right. Well, let's do a couple viewer questions. Musical Wolves is asking, with more Starlings, will we likely get a full re-entry coverage of Starship for Flight 4? You know what? I think if Starship, uh, if, if 28 had had a nominal uh, roll rate, <laughs> shall we say, <laughs> if it had been more controlled on entry, I suspect we would have had a full re-entry feed the entire time, but unfortunately, there was a loss of control with the vehicle, but I don't know. What do you think, Alex? Yeah, we we should first see Starship going through re-entry, and then we'll talk about whether Starlink holds or not. Because mm. I don't think Starlink was the problem of missing any any video. It was actually the ship <laughs> becoming right. pieces of molten metal. Right. <laughs> I mean, Ryan, the, what, what's your the, take? When the ship starts to enter engine first, you know, you, you start. You you might have a problem, but uh, yeah, I, when your payload bay door may or may not still be open, allowing <laughs> plasma to impinge on the internals of the structure, that's also not great. No, suboptimal. It's not. It's it's very suboptimal. Um, although more Starlinks is more bandwidth, so it's it helps. It helps the system as a whole. Uh, the real the real test will be when it actually is in a correct orientation on reentry and see if the plasma field at all like fully interferes with the Starlink connection or not. Um, that'll be the real test. So hopefully that happens on twenty nine. Fingers crossed. Fingers indeed crossed. Can I just say I love that there's a whole entire uh, side panel going on in the YouTube chat right now. <laughs> Hi YouTube <laughs> chat. Um, so yeah, let's keep going with some more questions. Gareth Cole is asking, I know you guys hate talking about them. Well, I, I don't know if it's you guys. It's definitely me, but I, I don't want to speak for everybody. But uh, anyways, they say, I know you guys hate talking about them, but serious question. Why no lightning towers at 39A? Max, do you want to take this one? Well, the fixed service structure, which is the big black tower, uh, which is the that's the main structure over at LC thirty nine A, and and it and it has been there the longest. It's been there since the very beginning of the space shuttle program, and if I'm not mistaken, that tower is also, I guess you could say, left over from the Apollo program. But there is a big old tower right sticking up for right on top of the the fixed service structure, and that serves essentially as the main lightning. Uh, diffusion diffusion system, I guess you could say, over over at the complex. So there's no need for four massive towers like at at uh, 39B or 40 or 41 because of of that one main structure, which was um, originally designed to protect the space shuttle. And of course, Falcon 9 still fits uh, underneath that, so there was no need for further uh, modification. Nice, very concise. Thank you, Max. Also, check your DMs. Uh. Moving right along, 
Lukewarm Milk is asking, is there any possibility we could see SpaceX <laughs> launch a human in a capsule made by a separate company with fairings around it, like Soyuz has around the capsule? I mean, I think if you pay SpaceX enough money, they'll do whatever you want. The likelihood of a separate company paying SpaceX to launch a crew on a separate capsule? I mean, then you have to get into, like, certification issues with NASA. It's a whole thing. So, I would yeah. say highly unlikely, but not impossible. I don't know, Ryan, it sounds like you have thoughts. I mean, it would really depend on what, like, the abort system would be for such a capsule, too. On whether or not it would work with a fairing. Because um, you would, if you use the Falcon 9 fairing, you'd have to modify that to to work with an abort system. Uh, so right. there'd be a lot of little different things you'd have to do in order to make that like certified in any way, shape or form. Right. I don't even know that a capsule inside a fairing would be certifiable, but uh, it's definitely certifiably insane. Ha <laughs> I hope I made Sawyer happy. Wait, 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 wait. Why not? Because how do you abort inside of a fairing, Alex? Ask Soyuz. It did twice. Actually, three times. So he's yeah. inside of a fairing. Yeah. Orion is also inside of a fairing, and Apollo was also inside of a fairing. All right. It's, you know what? I stand you know, corrected. You know yeah. how you get to a fairing, though? Through a support how? structure, which has a hatch on it that then, you know, you can go through. Mm -hmm. Speaking of support structures, the T is going to be venting real, real soon. So shall we talk about that? What a segue. Yeah. We're about to go. see the T-minus 20-minute vent as we are just under T-minus 20 minutes and 30 seconds. This is something we see with every Falcon 9 launch. In fact, a little while back, I was talking to a SpaceXer friend of mine, and they somehow didn't know that the T-minus 20-minute vent was a thing. And I was like, yeah, no, it, it happens every time. So, Alex, you want to give us a little bit of a rundown on what we're seeing happen right now with this T-minus 20-minute vent? Well, they should they should watch more NSF and also watch more of their feeds, I guess. Because it even happens with the Starship. Starship doesn't have it at T minus twenty minutes, but they also have their own version of the of the T minus twenty minute event, which is essentially chilling down the pipes that go to whatever thing you're loading. In this case, uh the T minus twenty minute event is for the second stage liquid auction line. So you're chilling down that line, throwing a little bit of liquid auction through that line and chilling it down, conditioning. So that, you know, whenever you actually go through and, you know, start flowing all of that liquid auction through to get that loaded into the second stage, you don't really, you know, have like flash boil off or, or bubbling issues like cavitation and things like that. And also the metal is already conditioned. You know, it, it's not like a sudden change in temperature for the metal and everything. It's really much better that way. And the same applies for the, for, for the Starship system, we all we also see the OLM pad, the tower vent, um, you know, venting, like we see venting from those two locations, which is precisely for the same reason. And in about 11 minutes and 55 seconds, the engines on the first stage of the, of the Falcon 9 also get chilled down a very similar procedure to flow a little bit of liquid oxygen through for the same reason. You don't want to damage things. Things are going to get very, very cold in certain locations, right? So you condition them, you prepare them. It's like training for a marathon, I guess, right? You, you kind of have to do some training before you actually go in and run a marathon. This is sort of the same in that sense. It, you stretch before you're working out because, I mean, they're two different Probably. rockets, but can't change the laws of thermodynamics. So mm -hmm. The laws of thermodynamics be a harsh mistress. I might be mixing Simpsons and Futurama references there, but you know what? That's that's the way it goes. Yeah, um, and sometimes when you get hot, you you like get you, things expand, and when they get cold, they they contract. And so right now, I think Jack's mouth needs to get cold. So I've, I've, yeah, I've no, seen, I'm dying. I've seen him asking for help in chat. So like, yeah, it's it's a little <laughs> concerning. We need some liquid oxygen to to yeah. you know. I would. We need I would to gladly. Give to, Eat Gladly locks. drink liquid oxygen right now. I'm I'm literally <laughs> dying. I don't know why I thought eating a California Reaper quesadilla would be would be a good idea before stream, but you know what? Here we are. I've made my bed. I'll lay in it. <laughs> um, we have a question from NASA Space Flight, whoever that is. They say, why rocket? You know what? A lot of people ask why rocket. Nobody ever asks how rocket. 
Oh my gosh. <laughs> or who or who rocket, right? Or how <laughs> rocket. Or in 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 tonight's case, when rocket. Yeah. Yeah. And the simple I, I, answer to all these questions is yes. About 17 minutes. About that long. That's right. Right. Yeah. Drew Neese is asking, can I see the launch in Port Charlotte? Can we bring up the, uh, the old trajectory map there? Let's see if we can take a look at that and examine where launch might be visible from. Ooh, fancy. So there you go. You can see the rings expanding to show at what point visibility occurs at what area of Florida. So I don't know where Port Charlotte is off the top of my head, but there you go. There's a vis visibility map for you. I'm Jacksonville. That, go ahead. I'm assuming that the ring is like when the rocket is like already above the horizon. Or I, I guess I should probably ask that to Ryan. <laughs> this, this, I mean, that uh, would make sense, right? This graphic, but yeah. It looks like Port Charlotte is like near Fort Myers. So, yeah. Definitely you have a lot visible more chances T plus four. South. That's, that's for sure. Right. So, there you go. There is your visibility map. Sadly, if you're in the panhandle, you're probably out of luck. But. Hey, if you're in the Bahamas, you're going to have a really nice view of landing. All right, let's move right along here. Jonathan Coleman is asking, are you going to cover the solar eclipse in, on April 8th? If so, what state are you going to see the full solar eclipse? I will be in Texas for the eclipse. We're going to try and have people from the NSF team all around the eclipse path and bring you a multitude of views so definitely stay tuned for that i may or may not have just spent over a thousand dollars on a solar telescope because i'm a crazy person but hey i actually got to test it out today and it's working pretty good so stay tuned we're definitely going all out for the eclipse stream and uh, we hope you choose us for your eclipse coverage I'll Ollie look at the, at the ground or something, because we don't, we don't have an eclipse here. Well, you can look at the stream, Alex. True. Thanks. That's a nice <laughs> alternative to looking <laughs> at the ground. Ollie Bronson is asking, how come you can only see the rocket's exhaust once it's already pretty far up in the sky? Partially because it's a liquid-fueled rocket. It's not a solid-fueled rocket, which leaves those very distinct plumes from the less efficient combustion. Um, and then also partially because that's when the rocket hits max Q and that plume is formed, right? Yeah, it's the condensation in the upper atmosphere mm -hmm. from, the, from the water. Vapor, I guess. All the words. <laughs> I don't really know how to scientifically explain it, but essentially that's, that's what happens. Like, it leaves that contrail. I mean, the, the exhaust... It, it, the exhaust itself, you can see it pretty much as it goes off the pad, because that's the, the bright thing. But then there's like more stuff that comes off the, the rocket that you cannot see, but it can leave a, a contrail behind if you know the, the light conditions are good. Indeed. Uh, and Ray, River Dave is asking, besides propellant, What's different between a Merlin and a Raptor? Well, certainly the combustion cycle type is much different. Ryan, you want to jump on that one? Yeah, well, Merlin is a... Relatively speaking, Merlin's a pretty simple engine. It's an open cycle, Carolox engine. It's, it's really hard to get any simpler than a Merlin. And it's simple, simple reliable, powerful. And there's a reason why it's a workhorse as it is. Then you get to Raptor. Raptor is Raptor's a lot more complicated. Uh, it's full flow stage combustion cycle, so it's a little bit harder to control, a little bit harder to start. Um, it uses both the both propellants are are uh, cryogenic compared to Merlin, and 
it you can get a decent amount more power out of it and you can get more performance out of it than Merlin because of the difference in feel. So those are the kind of the main differences with it. Um, but it being full flow stage combustion over open cycle, it's it's a much more complicated engine than Merlin. Yeah, more complicated, but for that complication, you also get greater efficiency. So it's all about trade-offs. Like anything in engineering, like anything in rocket science. I was going to say rocketry. I couldn't decide if I wanted to say rocketry or rocket science, but... Either works. Either works. Uh, if you if you out there in... Uh, Streamland happened to get some loud clanging noises. It sounds like my washer is about to commit a run, so I apologize in advance for that. Um, Probably anyways, taking moving, off. Yeah, moving right along. We're 11 minutes and 30 seconds to go. Jennifer is asking, what's the weight of the Starlings and dimensions? Just yeah. wondering if they fall out of the atmosphere. Well, Luckily, we don't have to worry about that necessarily. They'll just burn up. Um, I'm thinking of making a they're outside of the environment type joke, but <laughs> yeah, Alex, weight and dimensions of a Starlink satellite. Right now, we're on the what V2 Mini. Yeah, uh, my answer my answer to the question is like, ain't that the the, the real question? <laughs> we all have that question. I I don't think we have a, a specific sort of number on either the mass or the dimensions. We have good guess. I uh, I guess it's good guess. <laughs> um, but we don't really have a number because, well, SpaceX hasn't really set the exact number, both for mass and dimensions. The dimensions, we think it is pretty much around, you know, basically what is the 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 width of the of the fairing that is the dimension of of the of the satellite in terms of like the the surface and then the you know the height is maybe like 40 50 centimeters maybe a little bit more than that each satellite and then in terms of mass it looks to be around maybe 730 kilograms per per satellite more or less and that's sort of our guess based on multiple indications, which will be too long to, to explain right now. But that's sort of our best guess. Uh, all right. Well, fair enough. Thank you, Alex. All right. At this point, we should probably bid adieu to our very own Max Evans. Max, we love you. Have a good time <laughs> shooting the launch. Godspeed. We'll see you on the other side. Yeah, all of a sudden, it is rapidly rapidly that time to get ready for launch after we sc we scramble to get up here. So I will touch base with y'all after, hopefully, a, a successful liftoff. So good luck, everybody, and I'll see y'all on, on the other side. Wait, 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 wait. What kind of scramble? Like a like a Southwest scramble or like a like an omelet? Like, what are we talking here? <sighs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs> John Gardner, thank you so much for the support. Gifting five Red Team memberships. If you got a membership from John, be sure to thank them. Also, Blushy Boy, gifting a Red Team membership. Good old Bideford, gifting, uh, or super chatting, $25. They say, welcome all NSF nerds and wonderful hosts. Thanks for hanging in there for all of us. Thank you, Bideford, for your continued support. I'd rather be flying an X-Wing. Thank you for the super chat. They say, I'm going to start a fight. Stubby bad, West Coast, Best Coast, Enterprise Discovery, Starhopper, Meatball. You know what? It's, it's T minus 8 minutes and 20 seconds, so I don't know if we have time to do tribalisms for fun, but Stubby bad, yes. West Coast, good, yes. Atlantis, Best Shuttle, Starhopper, Not Hoppy, Worm. There, that's where I stand on all of the tribalisms. Um, but we can we can move right along since we're so close to launch. T minus eight minutes to go. The Stubby Rogers bad. talk. Yeah, stubby bad. I think we can all agree, stubby bad. Yeah. The Rogers Next talk. Is not thank here you. Anymore, so. for, <laughs> I know that's the best part. Uh, from the Rogers <laughs> family. Oh, I deleted it. I accidentally deleted it. I'm Good sorry, night. Rogers family. Rogers family, thank you for the support. I, I accidentally deleted your super chat here. I don't know what it said anymore. I'm a terrible person. I'd rather be flying an X-Wing. Thank you for the super chat. They say, oh, no, that's the same one. That's the one where they try oh, to start a fight. Oh, I see here. 
From the Rogers family, can you give the Shannon family a shout out for us? NSF, you guys are awesome. Thank you, Alex. Saving the day as usual. I scroll back on the YouTube chat. Thanks. Nice. And Drew Nar, thank you for the support. They say, hello, off topic, but does anyone know the mass to windward surface area of Starship Ooh. versus shuttle? That No, that is a that is an intense question. I don't think anybody knows that. Not off the top of their head, anyway. But uh, maybe ask that on Monday's Static Fire stream, and maybe we'll have an answer for you. I just, I just say in general, we, uh, we, we have an idea of what the surface area of the ship is. The thing is, the flaps move, so the surface area changes. And then on top of that, we don't a hundred percent know the dry mass. So yeah, yeah, there's you can't really answer that question accurately. So it's a bit complicated. Yeah. yeah. Just a little bit. Hmm. Just under T minus six minutes and 30 seconds to go for the launch of Starlink 6 42. Kenan Copeland is asking, This is number 42. Does SpaceX do anything special with that? I mean, no indications so far yeah. that this is anything other than a standard Starlink mission, but yes, 42. It's the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Yeah. Well, the only Great thing movie. special, I guess, is that they're flying a 19 booster, right? Like it's it's the 19th flight of this booster. It is the turnaround record for 39A. Um, other than that, it's pretty much your standard Starlink Group 6 mission. Alex, Cape, at this point, so. how many boosters do they have at 19 flights? Like, is this tying two or three boosters? or There's, there's several, right? Yeah, there are another two, B-1061 from Vandenberg and B-1062, which, by the way, was the last launch from here from 39A, was B-1062 on Starlink 644. So, you know, back-to-back -back 19th flights from, from this path. That's quite amazing. Uh, but, yeah, we you know, this is the fourth booster to reach 19 flights, the third active, sadly, because, you know, we lost... B1058, uh, if you remember, Rip. back in December. But, you know, we have this one, at least. So, knock and boot, it reaches the ground in one piece, and hopefully um, that happens. Obviously, it's landing on a, on, on a drone ship again, so uh, let's hope for, for good weather on the way back. Indeed. Thinking of back. You know what's going to be back? The strong the back. The strong back? Yes, because it's going to be retracting nice. about a minute. So that's going to be the first retraction of this strong back before launch. Are you spelling it strong back like B A C C? Yeah. Yes, yes. You, you trying to pull Sawyer here, Alex? Yeah, because he, he's, he's missing, right? He's, he's not available yeah. today, so I guess I have to fill in. No one Where... can challenge the master, though. So. Sawyer really forces us all to up our game in terms of puns. That is but true. There you, here we go. We have a really nice view of the fairing with that last shot. Speaking Absolutely beautiful stuff. <laughs> what? Go ahead. I was gonna say, speaking of Sawyer, he's in the chat. <laughs> oh, oh of hi, course Sawyer. He is. Sawyer, you have a bad take on bagels, but we love you anyways. Uh oh. <laughs> Shots fired. I know I said we didn't have time for tribalism, and then I did it. Uh, Methane Man, thank you for gifting five red team memberships. Yet another one of those names we see pop up all the time. Be sure to thank Methane Man if you got a membership from them. And Force Master 2000, thank you so much. They say the game is afoot. Does that mean we all just lost the game? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. I think, we, I think we lost the game. No, it, we didn't. Is it's this okay. Chang? Is this Chang from like Star Trek Undiscovered Country? You know, to be or not to be? Is that where we're going here? What? No. Okay, I'm not that, that nerd. Okay, never mind. Moving on. Moving right along. Two minutes stage and one seconds complete. to go. Mr. And with Jack. that, thank you, Alex. Stage one locks load is complete. And in about 40 seconds or so, we're going to see another vent similar to that T minus 20 minute vent that we saw previously. And it's basically 
doing the same sort of thing as the T minus 20 minute event, but instead of for the first stage, it is for the second stage, right, Alex? Yeah, well, the the other one is also for for the, for the second stage. The only difference is that the the first one was to sort of chill it down ahead of the loading, but now the loading is being completed in just a few more seconds. So once it is complete, you don't there's sort of residual liquid oxygen there. You just want to to get it out, get it out. Like we don't need that, right? Um, if you have that in for whatever reason, you catch fire or whatever, that's not good. You just want to have that out of the of the lines. So that is always nice and, and perched. And there Excellent. we go. That vent is coming back. Stage 2 liquid oxygen load is complete. And the Falcon 9 is now fully loaded with propellants. I will never get tired of seeing that pale blue tinge from a liquid oxygen vent. It's just one of those things that is a natural thing and it's beautiful. All right, we are coming up on T minus one minute to go here. And at that point, Falcon 9's onboard computer takes control of the count. And if anything goes awry, with a few exceptions, the onboard computer will abort the process. Right, Ryan? Uh, yeah, at this point in time, uh, the onboard computer for the Falcon 9 is in control. And if there's anything that... It doesn't like any sensor that's out of range or anything. It'll auto abort the count and uh, they'll scrub. So, but we don't want that. We want to launch. <laughs> Indeed, we want to launch. Hopefully, in just about thirty-five seconds here. We are go for launch. I was waiting for it. Thank you, Alex. LD yeah, me saying. Too. That we are too go late. for launch. T minus 15 seconds. As usual, we will be a little bit quiet during launch and listening to the launch sounds. But T minus 10, here we go. There's the deluge. Go, internet satellites, go. There's the T tab, ignition, and liftoff of Starlink 6 42. Let's listen in. shot of Falcon 9 going into the clouds there. <laughs> Love that crackle. Uh, the clouds are locking in. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's alright. It's just a little cloudy. It's still good. It's still good. It's still flying, right? Yeah. It's still flying, right? <laughs> there we go. Uh, 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 we see more. We see more. Now it's Beautiful. a bit of a game of what can we see with the with the clouds in front. Well, the clouds are providing a little bit of a neutral density filter, a natural neutral density filter, letting us see that exhaust plume a little bit better. <laughs> All right, the vehicle is now ascending, and it is past max Q, right? Yeah, right, right now they are in the process of essentially approaching Miko. They're doing that sort of engine chill on the MVAC engine. You can see some of that on the left-hand side here, that sort of venting coming from the interstage that is the engine chill from the MVAC engine. But yeah, we're approaching that that sort of basically Miko main engine cut off, all nine engines shut down in pairs. Then we see separation and MVAC ignition, that upper stage engine will ignite and hopefully put 
these 22, 23 satellites, excuse me, into low Earth orbit. Let's stand by for that. Here we are. Waiting for stage SEP. We have Miko. And stage SEP. Excellent. And no stiff in a ring. It. And radiation. <laughs> yeah. No. I wonder it's, what they've done to those nozzles to, to not need a stiff in a ring anymore. I'm kind of curious. Right. It, that's such a good question. Like, how did they eliminate the need for that? How was the stiff in a ring, which is seemingly very diminutive and uh, minuscule compared to the size of the rocket, uh, like, how, how was eliminating it so helpful that they went through the trouble of doing so? That's pretty remarkable. Ooh, we're coming up on fairing step. There you have it. Now the Starlink satellites are exposed to the vacuum of the space. And now we can safely say that, you know, if they have something interesting going on, at least it's something that we can see. Because on that, on that Starlink mission from Vandenberg, they launched those right. two extra satellites, and we didn't see the satellites. Wow, look at that. Have you seen it? Mm. Have you seen the lightning from the from the booster camera? Yeah, that's beautiful. Wow. Oh. Yeah, there's a couple that. of storms over the Atlantic. Oh, look at that. Look at oh. that. Ooh. Oh, that's <laughs> so cool. Oh, hi, Max. Excellent. Oh, hello. hello. Oh, you're, you're back. back. Hi. Talk. Holy Say moly, words. That's gorgeous. Um, I really hope you guys were on my feed right as it went in, into the cloud layer because the the it, the entire silhouette of Falcon 9 was lit so beautifully. I really hope you guys caught that. Um, but oh my goodness, that it went. She's off the ground. Mm -hmm. And I think this is like one of the more unique. This has to be one of the mo most unique um, audio experiences here yet for a launch because as it went up and, and arched over towards uh, stage separation, the sound came and went in waves. I've never heard it like that before. Like it would come and then it would go, and then you would also feel it too. Like it, it, it came in and out like thunder. It was it was remarkable. Um, and actually, I, have... I can see I can see stage two now, just just now below the clouds. I'm, I'm not sure I can get that, but it's just now below the cloud layer there, uh, like way below the moon. Um, but holy cow, that was magnificent. Nice. Thank you for the field report, Max, and thank you for shooting the launch for us. And also thank you to D out there as well, shooting the launch for us. Mm -hmm. I have experienced something a little bit similar out of, a, out of Vandenberg. Uh, there was an Atlas V launch that was a similar thing where the sound would, would increase and then recede and then increase and then recede. I don't know what atmospheric phenomenon or weather pattern that can be attributed to, but it's uh it's it's truly spectacular to experience. So I'm I'm glad you got a nice auditory show there tonight, Max, despite the clouds. Well there and clouds there's, out. And, oh yeah. There's there's still plenty of clouds out here and there's there's also lightning visible um all up on the horizon, all, all the way between pad A and pad forty one. And you all we, we can also see some lightning or we did see some lightning from the onboard booster cam as well as as it was turning around after stage up. Um very just wicked conditions out here tonight. Yeah, the the sound might change, might well, because the sound might change speeds a little bit when it goes through the cloud, in and out of the clouds. Yeah, since you have heavy moisture sure. and everything, and that changes. Oh. So that's probably what oh, doing it. Entry oh. burn, entry burn, lovely. We just saw entry burn here, and then it went right into the clouds. Oh. Yeah, sometimes when there's good weather, you can actually catch it. We see it yes. from your feet. Yes. There you go. They, Merlin no Engines luck. on the first stage doing their thing and slowing the stage down. Ooh. And look at that. D still has the second stage. Wow. Good work tracking. Yeah, because we are I, seven minutes after launch, and this is still being, being tracked. I really, I can't express how difficult of a thing it is to do to track what is essentially like a single pixel on your stream. There you go. It's actually Good. dimmer than, than like 95% of stars in the, in the, in the night sky. It's a, it's a really, it's a, it's a really big challenge. Right. Like if you lose it, it's gone. 
It, exactly <laughs> right. Like if, you, if your eyes adjust to any light that is any brighter than that, you're done. You've lost it. All right, well, you can see the telemetry on stream. The second stage continuing to accelerate to an orbital velocity while the first stage continues to decelerate. And we're about to get landing of that first stage here in just a few seconds. So we'll keep our eyes open on the left side of the screen for that. Standing by for the landing burn. It'll be coming up in just a few seconds. Hmm. Alex, do we know what the landing profile on this is going to be? Like a 131 style burn? One single engine. Yeah, that, there you go. There we go. It's funny because you can see first on the telemetry and then on the video feed. <laughs> I will never get tired of seeing the speed rapidly scrub off. And there's the drone ship. And watching the oh, yeah, Griffins working too. Just, here we go. Look at that feed. Unbroken. Beautiful. Solid all the way through. Beautiful stuff. On the money. 19 right. landings for this booster. Now. Right in the center, no less. You'll love to see it. And here we go. We're coming up on Seco 1. And there we have it. Good orbit. Sweet. I don't, I don't even orbit. need the, them to say that because I already see the telemetry and it's mm -hmm. exactly the same velocity and altitude as every other Starlink mission that they have launched from the Cape. <laughs> Another one of the loops. 27,050 27, something kilometers per hour at 152 kilometers in altitude. <laughs> and now we have our favorite view on a launch day, an empty pad. Which means the rocket launched. Hooray! Yay. Do you guys think we'll get a feed of spacecraft SEP? I guess we'll have to find out, won't we? So. Maybe after the fact. So that's like one hour from now. Yeah. Got it. All right, well, there you have it. 23 more Starlings on their way into their orbit. We do have some replays coming up, so we'll stand by for that. Don't go anywhere. We got some excellent replays of launch coming in hot, much like the booster just did. <laughs> you know what? While we wait on the replays, I might as well ask. Ben Glasgow wants to know our current prediction for the next. Starship launch. I'm going to say mid-May. Oh Alex? Um, I'm more towards June. That's my thinking right now. We'll see. As I what always say, prove me wrong, SpaceX. Right. What do you think is the long pull here? Is it, is it the mishap investigation? Is it pad refurb? Is it vehicle work? What do you think? I think we're going to see testing. I mean, they already have a Ship 29 out there, right? And we sort of, there's already a scheduled closure for Monday. So they're probably going to get some, you know, one static fire maybe on Monday. And then they said static fires, plural. So I'm guessing they're going to do another single engine burn, uh, you know, mimicking the whole, you know, in space burn thing. So I'm guessing that'll probably happen later in the week. And then we're going to have Booster 11 rolling out in a couple of weeks from now. Static fire before the middle of April, then back to the production site, put all the mods from all of the you know reviews because right now they're they're reviewing things from the from the third flight. Doesn't make sense to do all the mods now because they don't know in the first place what mods they need, right? So it makes more sense to just test the vehicles first, then do the mods, and if they need any more testing afterwards, at least they do all of the big testing is already done basically by then. So that's my, my guess, and I'm thinking that it's probably going to take an, another month or so. It took about a month for Ship 28 and Booster 10. So my guess is Ship 29 and Booster 11 is going to be the same. So mid-May for full stack, June launch, early June. Brian, what earliest. do you think? Yeah, I'm kind of going with that too. Um, it really Because a lot of things, but it also entirely depends on how long the mishap investigation takes and that could 
take a little bit of time. That could also take a lot of time. Uh, it really depends on what went wrong or if they can find what went wrong pretty quickly. Um, and I think they'll they'll get their engine testing out of the way, and then the vehicles will just sit in their in their their respective bays until SpaceX is ready, basically for launch. Where they'll roll it out, they'll do a single stack for fit checks, and then they'll install FTS and go. I don't think there's going to be a wet dress this time around. I think, I think when they roll out for they do that final rollout, it's going to be like two weeks before launch or something like that or less. So makes sense. Yeah. Ooh, we have a cool shot from Sawyer. Can we take a look at Sawyer's photograph here? Beautiful. Nice work, Sawyer. Even mm -hmm. if you have a bad take on bagels. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a bad take on bagels up here that I missed? Yeah, Sawyer doesn't think an everything jalapeno cheddar bagel is a bagel, but you know what? I digress. That just sounds gross. You sound gross, Max. You sound gross. I know gross. I do, but, but, we always, but we already know this. <laughs> oh, goodness. Excellent work, oh, Sawyer. Replay. You know what? Let's take a look at the replays. Yes. I believe this is from D's camera. There's ignition oh. and liftoff. Wow. Look at that, that. Exposure setting so perfect. Terrific. That nice. Yeah, that's excellent. Ooh, do we get some nice cloud interactions? Hopefully, we fingers crossed. I think crossed. we absolutely should from, from this angle and that focal length. Absolutely. Come on. Going Gosh, I mean, already. we see so many Falcon 9s launch these days that it can begin to feel slightly routine, but just holy cow. This is a skyscraper oh, size machine. Oh, yes! look at that. That's beautiful. Like, and they kept tracking through the clouds. Excellent work. An arrow through the clouds. I, I, again, I cannot wait for a Starship launch from this pad. I can't. It's especially a nighttime launch like this. Oh right. Oh my god. That's there's there's so many fun Starship milestones to look forward to. The first night launch, the first catch of the booster, the first catch of the ship. The first, eight, the first HLS starship, the first starship to carry a payload. I, I, the, the future is bright. Or, or I mean, even even that, and I'll go off an even non SpaceX one. I mean, a night like this with New Glenn launching. Oh, you know, honestly, I, I think photographing a methane rocket at night is going to be a a really tough challenge. I mean, we already yeah, we already the flame learned is this so much from more Terran dim. One. Yes. Yes. It's dim. It doesn't produce as much light, so it's, so it's much more difficult to expose for. And depending on what, on what focal length you're shooting, it might just be... You might get nothing but uh, blurry shots. Who knows? Um, but Starship itself, I'm not sure how that, that would look at night. Obviously, Terran 1 was very, was very small, but uh, scale that up many orders of magnitude for Starship, so you never, you never know. <laughs> I, I you mean, know, the... You know how they say... And and I guess this is probably the best the best way to to say to talk about this. You know how they say that they the, the, that each launch turns the night day. Yes. Right. Like imagine this, but like maybe ten times more. That's a starship. It's full <laughs> daylight. Probably, you could probably even read the, the the paper or something under the light of of the engines. <laughs> like I, I mean, we we've seen how big that exhaust trail is. Like that exhaust trail is like two and a half times the length of the vehicle. Like just, I mean, imagining that out of the Cape, everyone's going to be like, what is that? Is, honestly, I mean, what I, is that? Like, like a thousand feet of flame. That's insane. I mean, honestly, I mean, just, just my take, I don't think it's going to be that bright to be honest with you. I, I genuinely believe Falcon is Falcon is brighter than, than Starship will be at night just because methane is, the, me the way the way methane interacts with the atmosphere po post combustion, it's not bright at all. It's really not, and and you and you learn that through through of course shooting it. And and when I, I exposed for a Starship in the first three flights, you pretty much expose for the ambient light, maybe maybe a smidge darker, and you have pretty much full flame detail unless you're looking right up into the bells. But right. um, 
nothing I think will compare to Artemis One. That literally turned night into day. Yeah, and Jack, Those... and Jack, you were you were here for that too. I was, and you are right, Max. Nothing. Like, it doesn't matter size of rocket, it doesn't matter anything, but those solid boosters, once they ignite, it truly is the sort of thing where day becomes, or sorry, night becomes day. Uh, And and yeah, I'm still bummed we have to wait so long until the next Artemis launch, but you know what? There are more coming, and I'm excited for them, whether they're at night or during the day but either way starship no matter what time it launches is always max oh Oh, wow (laughs) good job max good job i'm loving this replay but yes either way anytime starship launches it will be exceptional day or night love the replays i'm glad that we were able to get those in here good deal and actually, quick, quick uh, little update from the pad. The transporter erector is already pretty much vertical again. Hey, nice. Gotta get ready for the next launch. Absolutely. Which, now I don't remember which... Oh, it, it should be maybe... Should be on Monday, I think, pad. over at it's, over it's like 40 for Star Wars. Yeah, the first, the first launch from... The, the next launch from the cave... Okay, save first. Uh, the next <laughs> launch from the cave is going to be slick, uh, from Slick 40 uh, on Monday. We're going to see you all then, I hope. You got to... You get up. You gotta be here for 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 that if you're watching this this stream. But yeah, and then after that we have uh, NRL seventy, Delta Four Heavy, last one, and then oh, you'll set thirty sixty yeah. out from from thirty nine games. So the next one is gonna be a GTO launch, a rarity as well. Like we we're used to either you know commercial crew or cargo or some Falcon Heavy with some classified payload, and now we're gonna get a commercial launch that is not a Starlink. Nice. Nice. I can't believe it's not Starlink. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> somebody somebody Photoshop that onto a tub of butter, please. Or I think I guess that was that actually Gavin. Butter. I think that was Gavin. Butter. Yeah. You know, we're going nice. to say the same thing with Starship 2. It's going to be like when there's a non Starlink launch at one point, it's going to be like, I can't, or tanker flights. Like, I can't believe it's not yeah. a tanker flight I or a Starlink flight. Exactly. It's going to be, I can't believe it's not a star, it's not a tanker or, or a Starlink. Yeah. uh space pope uh space pope thank you for the very generous 50 dollars super chat one of those names once again that we see pop up all the time so thank you space pope they say space whale is the space pope's pope mobile really not not space turtle all right you know what you do you and bacon powered Tesla, thank you for the super chat. They say, enjoying your excellent coverage while my car downloads full self driving 12.3. A total nerd Saturday night. Here's bacon money for Jack. Thank you so much. <laughs> bacon. Bacon good. All right. Well, I think with that, we will wrap things up. Thank you all so much for watching tonight's stream as more internet satellites were blasted into orbit alex thank you for being on commentary it's been a pleasure and ryan thank you as well it's a pleasure as always jack always have fun on here indeed and i believe jay was in the background operating the stream thank you jay and we also had max out in the field operating a tracking camera and we had D out in the field operating a tracking camera. So thank you so much to the entire team. You can see their info popping up in the top right there. Follow them on Twitters. Follow them on the socials. However you choose to consume your media in this day and age. And of course, follow NASA Spaceflight wherever you like to. We've got the Instagram. I think we even have a TikTok. I don't know. I'm so old. Either way, thank you so much, everyone, for the support and for following along. Also, thank you to Adrian for being on the stream earlier as well. But with that, we will leave y'all to hang out on Space Coast Live or Starbase Live or McGregor Live, whatever you choose. Either way, you can't stay here, but 
you don't have to leave or whatever the expression is. I don't know. My mouth is still on fire from the California Reaper quesadilla. I'm Jack Byer for NSF and I'm going to go drink a whole lot of milk. Until then, we'll see you guys next time. And here we go. Chamber pressure looks good. Following up. Water tower is flying! Yes! Tingle down the nominal. Mighty down by a off. It's orange! Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! Decollage! Look at that! Put that in the big bag, you know? 343 unfolds to go. Indeed. We rise together, back to the moon and beyond. This is nothing to be igniting the flare, correct? Right?